This evening, as you know, is psychedelics and Buddhism on my side, and Buddhism and psychedelics on that side. <laughs> so let's start with just a little silent meditation. Um, probably most people have some experience with some kind of meditation. Maybe the most basic instructions that would um, be very beneficial for any Buddhist meditation or any psychedelic journey would be to be very present and open and aware of what's happening to you and your body and mind. So just for a few minutes, we'll uh, just sit. My name is Tokyo. Uh, should we say a little bit about ourselves? No, much as you are willing to share. Uh, I've been a Zen Buddhist priest for uh, 18 years uh, in the tradition of uh, Suzuki Roshi in San Francisco Zen Center. And um, mostly living in, in monasteries or similar environments over that time. And uh, before I got into practice, or maybe around the same time I was getting into practice, uh, some um, psychedelic experiences were, were really formative for me. And I think this is true of many people who end up getting into long-term Buddhist practices. They begin their practice with uh, a whole new way of seeing the world through such an experience. And often then they'll, they'll put it aside or, or they'll integrate it some way. Um, but uh, for me, it's, it's something that I really honor in my life. Uh, and, and that's something we can explore. Is there, is there some connection there? But for me, I think it was a significant condition for basically like giving my whole life to Buddhist practice. <clears throat> Just have a look about yourself. I'm Jim, and uh, I guess mine might be the opposite story. <laughs> that uh, when I used psychedelics, I had no interest in Buddhist practice, <laughs> and I have um, become incredibly fond of. The, the wisdom of Buddhism, um, as well as the wide range of opinions uh, within the Buddhist community to, about um, psychedelics and about the whole question of, of natural and unnatural. And when, when we met and, and really liked each other, uh, I said, you know, it would be interesting just if we talked about this. And uh, much to my amazement, uh, Kyoka said, yeah, that's a good idea. And then I said, how about it at your Zendo, which would not have told us all. And uh, we ended up actually changing rooms uh, because when we put out the notion that we would discuss this as a group, um, a great many people expressed interest. <clears throat> and then a lot of people, as happens this day, said, well, why don't you film it, podcast it, stream it, um, make it easy for me. Uh, and particularly when they were saying this from South Africa and from Canada, um, from Croatia, uh, we then uh, asked Bryce if he would uh, make this eventually available to other people. Because it looks like it is um, a concern. Uh, certainly it's a concern um, 
those, those of us who work primarily in the psychedelic world, research and otherwise, um, are very aware that there's a range of experiences which apparently appear, appear to overlap the mm -hmm. classical mystical experiences of the great traditions. And there's a huge number of psychedelic experiences that have nothing to do with that. And that as we look in the kind of literature, most of that distinction is totally fuzzed away. Uh, the people who basically psychedelics are good for everything um, on one side, and the people that psychedelics are um, somewhat worse than your fantasy of the political party you're not going to vote for. <laughs> also appear. And, and then the, um, so that, that every tradition has its, um, its different versions of what's the correct way to be. And I, I looked at my own background, what I knew about Buddhism, and I thought, I'm actually fairly open on this topic because my concern is um, what is the proper place of altered states of consciousness in contemporary society. And one of the places where it is the most open for discussion is within Buddhism. Um, I, uh, someone suggested that if this was an interesting event that we might you know, go on tour <laughs> to say San Francisco. <laughs> and I wrote back and said, should we do another one on Christianity and psychedelics? And the response was, you won't get many people to go. So it's a curious, um, curious about that distinction. And what we're hoping to do this evening is uh, look at some basic precepts of Buddhism and where the issue comes up. Um, and then really find out why you're here and what your questions are or, uh, or things like that. And this has been put together by an enormous team of people. Um, it may take a village to raise a child, it takes more than that to put on evening. And so there have been people who have donated time and chairs uh, and brownies um, and sound system, and film, uh, the co-sponsors of uh, Sophia University, and there are people back there you may want to talk to about Sophia University, which used to be called the Institute for Transpersonal Psychology. Um, maps most of you ran into if you came in through the door. Um, and the Council for Spiritual Practices has sent along um, a few gifts uh, for those of you who are somewhat more serious in your Buddhist practices. And so let me just ask a question, a little, just a little bit of demographics which is, how many of you have not used psychedelics? Not used psychedelics. Okay, um, there you are. Okay. <laughs> how many of you have not participated in something um, that a Buddhist helped you participate in? Okay. So the overlap, except for one person, is right 100%, okay? which statistically, we, he gets to be thrown out. <laughs> That's how psychology science works. If there's something that goes against your preconception, you then screw around with the data long enough until you hear it. <laughs> one might say there's a parallel in religious history, but we won't go there. <laughs> So that's what we're here to do. And so the evening is really open between us and open between us. Um, several things just to keep in mind. One, it's warm in here. And what I found is when a room is uncomfortable, if we all acknowledge that, then that's the way it is. And so um, this, is, this is not San Francisco, where one is allowed to take off as much as you wish. but you are welcome to take off an awful lot, <laughs> should you wish. And we will have breaks. Uh, bathrooms are down this hallway. And I think that probably handles the basics. I'll be handing out, this is also, and this is a question. Um, I would like you to be participants in a national research study, for which I have a one-page form that takes about five minutes. 
and I would be very appreciative if you would. Uh, and I also already have one request from an East Coast researcher um, who wants to know whatever it is we find. Because where else am I going to get this kind of a group? Um, and uh, someone has accused me of, of developing crowdsourced research. <laughs> uh, and once I read it, I thought, ooh, that's so much better than I thought of. <laughs> I just thought, since I'm here someplace, I can kind of exploit people. <laughs> so I do have a one-page form, which I'll hand out at some point. Um, the other is, uh, let me just give you a little news from the hinterlands. Uh, and, and this is actually not known until, you know, to very, very few people. But um, John Hopkins, as some of you may know in the psychedelic world, has been doing a series of research studies, including a number of them dealing with the interaction of spiritual experience and psychedelics. There's a lot of other research with various uh, illnesses, but this is the only set of studies about health. Um, this is from the senior investigator, uh, Roland Griffiths. We have an, a study in active planning stages to investigate the subjective, behavioral, and neural MRI, acute and enduring effects of psilocybin in long-term meditators. We expect to start enrolling during the first quarter of 2013. Because of the many study visits over the course of four months, participants will be restricted to those that live within easy commuting distance of John Hopkins. Um, if you have people who live near John Hopkins, which is in Baltimore, um, who are already serious meditators, they're doing a study at the moment where they're saying to people, we'll give you psilocybin if you will meditate. <laughs> <laughs> that one actually filled pretty fast. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that is also the level of seriousness that is going on. So they're looking at it in a, um, in a kind of a scientific paradigm. We're looking at it in, I'd say, a Buddhist paradigm. So let's talk Buddhism for a while. Thank you. Uh, just to kind of set the stage a little bit from the Buddhist perspective. <clears throat> First of all, Buddhism is, we could say many things about it, but uh, um, foremost, it's about uh, kindness and care for each other. And um, so let's have that be the, the mode for the evening. Uh, Facebook was one of the main ways we advertised this event. And there were some um, strong debates, maybe we could say, going on in the Facebook events page about this issue. And um, sometimes the tone was not um, completely kind and gentle. So um, there's room for debate, of course. We want to we want to challenge each other, but let's do it really kindly with um, with loving speech tonight. <clears throat> and also, I think it's nice to start this conversation with with one of the um, big issues that people have in Buddhism around this topic is what we call the fifth precept. Mm. For those who uh, don't know Buddhism. Uh, there's, from the earliest days of the Buddha up to the present day, all Buddhist traditions uh, we call um, ethical precepts. Uh, this is the foundation the Buddha taught for all other practices. Practices of meditative <coughs> absorption and wisdom of non-duality. Always precepts, ethical conduct comes first. And uh, that seems appropriate to me, that seems wonderful. We could say it comes first and it comes last, too, because in the end, a realization of non-duality, say, uh, is for the purpose of meeting others with love and compassion and non-separation. So, uh, the fifth precept, this, is, this is, goes back to the early Buddhist time for lay people and monastics all agree on these precepts. And uh, the Zen tradition I'm part of, and Padrayana and Theravada, everyone agrees on these basic five precepts. And they're, they're about ethical conduct, they're about how we um, refrain from harming each other. So, not killing living beings, not taking what's not given, 
stealing from others, not misusing sexuality in a harmful way, not speaking falsely, lying to protect ourselves and, and uh, harm others. And the fifth one is um, it originally worded in the, in the Pali and Sanskrit as um, not uh, consuming alcoholic beverages that lead to heedlessness or carelessness. And I think it's interesting that the other, the first um, four are not explained. They're, it's maybe obvious. Killing, stealing, misusing sexuality, lying. Um, so in the original language list, they're very short. But this one is much longer line. It's the one that explains the reason for it. And I think it's partly because um, these precepts are ethical. They're not just, they're not about like, how the mind works necessarily. They're, I think the Buddha originally taught them as these are just ways to avoid harming others. And uh, so the Buddha could see, even 2,500 years ago, that, um, that alcohol could lead to basically breaking all the other precepts, as we call heedlessness or carelessness, leads to harming others. If it doesn't, then that's great. But he just saw that pattern again and again. And I think that there was, you know, in the Buddhist time, we're not sure, but probably cannabis was being used in India at that time. It's interesting that he didn't include that. He, it, it specifically says alcohol. Uh, now, in modern America, we, we say, well, but it's much more complicated. We have all these other uh, so-called intoxicants, so we just say not intoxicating or taking intoxicants. Uh, but if we look to the tradition, it's it's uh, we can see, and also we can see in modern times that I think I read this statistic that um, there's a hundred thousand deaths per year due to alcohol-related issues, and um, I don't know if there's if there's been any deaths related to psychedelic issues. Maybe a few, uh, especially maybe accidents, things like that, but um, not kind of like physical, internal harm. I mean, we could talk about this more. But um, uh, I think the main issue is, does it lead to harming others? Does it lead to carelessness and heedlessness where we start disrespecting others through having altered our mind in some way? So if we do or don't um, use psychedelics, this would be like the bottom line thing. Is it harmful to others? And ourselves is included too. Um, now, in uh, in early Buddhism and current uh, what we call Theravada school, they interpret precepts very literally. So um, it's like the Buddha taught it. Um, no, not a drop of alcohol. You know, and people follow, in Thailand, for example, some people may follow this very literally. Um, in what we call Mahayana Buddhism, of which Zen is a part, and Vajrayana, uh, Tibetan Buddhism is a part. There's a slightly different take on the precepts. It's, they're more about uh, skillful means and compassion for others. <clears throat> so they're not necessarily followed completely, literally, the way it's said. And this is not just a modern thing, this goes back to ancient Indian teachings, of bodhisattva path, where um, compassion comes foremost. So like a common example would be, like there's a piece that's about lying. In the early tradition, it's like, no matter what, you just never lie. Uh, in the Mahayana kind of skillful means bodhisattva tradition, it's whatever is beneficial to people. So say you have a um, <clears throat> an innocent person hidden in your house, and um, somebody comes uh, looking for them to kill them, for example. You want to protect them. And they say, is that person in your house? You say, no, no, they're not. You lie. And the, the Bodhisattva's vow, in this case, is to break the literal precept to help that person. That's the Mahayana spirit of precepts. So this fifth precept is dangerous because um, uh, we have to ask, if, if we go against the literal meaning, 
of either alcohol or, or to include all kinds of other um, drug, anything that alters the mind in any way. Uh, if we violate that on the grounds of compassion, like we think this would be beneficial to others or ourselves, we have to be very, very careful. I think we, it's very easy to fool ourselves. That's why this Mahayana great vehicle is uh, very challenging. It's, it's why it's more profound in a way than just literally following rules. It's like we really have to ask deeply and very honestly <coughs> check with ourselves, do we really feel this is beneficial? So I think that's a good context to look at um, use of different substances. Is it, we feel like it'd be beneficial to ourselves and from a bodhisattva perspective, uh, we don't really think so much about is it beneficial to ourself as the foremost thing, but is it beneficial to our our ongoing unfolding of realization so that we can help others? It's really about compassion and helping others in the end. So some people might go into like solitary retreat for years and years. It might not look like that's compassionate work to help others, but if they're doing it in the bodhisattva spirit, they're doing that work on themselves in order to eventually benefit others, particularly benefit others by um, the realization that we're really not separate. Anything that helps unfold this radical realization that we are not separate um, seems very beneficial. So that's one way of talking about this fifth precept. And uh, it's not kind of like licensed to do whatever, it's, it's more like the challenge to look really deeply. Do we feel like if we go against a literal meaning of a precept, uh, we, have to act, we have to be very scrutinizing with ourselves about our intention. It's basically, it's about intention. Is this a beneficial intention for ourselves and others? <clears throat> Maybe that's enough on that point. Uh, it seems to me one one of the issues I see in the arguments uh, rarely are at this uh, sensible level, but the argument internally is a serious question: is does the use of psychedelics, though, to having psychedelic experiences, uh, improve or degrade my practice? Now this isn't yet outside of the person, so we're this uh, this discussion about this question about what does it do to practice um, is very internal, and I have uh, been educating myself with, of course, the help of uh, divine providence, meaning people send me stuff who I've never met about something else, and in it is a little gem. Uh, and just looking, and uh, uh, today I was told this, just to, just, I want to give you a few of these, so it's a little bit of what the issues are personally. Um, this is an Alan Watts story that uh, Tom um, told me this afternoon, that Alan, near the end of his life, and Alan was one of the great popularizers of Buddhism, and within the Buddhist community there are two points of view, too much popularization, etc. Uh, or good for you, Alan. Um, near the end of his life, he was asked by a young man, is it worthwhile to take LSD? Seems kind of right in your face. After pondering a bit, Alan replied, that's like asking me if life is worthwhile. And, Alan continued, for God's sake, don't take any street acid. <laughs> so there's a level of... Uh, kind of bodhisattvaness and a level of extreme practicality. <laughs> um, there's a website which I don't necessarily recommend called DMT Nexus, that some of you may know. Um, this is from October 6th. I can say this after a lifetime of meditating and two and only two trips on shrooms done in the last 10 days. Psychedelics are not just a trip. The lasting, and I mean they don't disappear after the trip is over, the lasting effects are huge. They're bigger than the trips. 
the changes in me have been profound and seem substantially permanent. But I agree with others, it is best to work on yourself using all available methods. And a comment from someone I don't know named Oliver Hockenhall. I personally know a Zen monk who's the holder of a lineage who's practiced Zen for over 30 years. His one experience with MDMA was the only experience, as he reported it, that allowed a full opening of his heart. And from someone, this is a professor who has, until very, very recently, after he retired, not mentioned a vast number of high dosage LSD experiences. Um, this is a little piece of an article that he recently wrote. After the collective purification ended, I was spun into the radiance of what, using Buddhist vocabulary, I perceive to be the domain of diamond luminosity. I've known light many times before, but this was an exceptionally pure light. The domain captivated me so completely that it completely extinguished any interest I had in exploring the various subtle dimensions of our typical reality that had previously fascinated me. This was a different order of reality altogether. Its clarity was so overwhelming, its energy so pure, that returning to it quickly became my deepest agenda in future sessions. After my first initiation into this reality, it took five sessions of intense purification and surrender before the doors opened again and I was returned to the diamond light, now experienced in a slightly deeper and even purer form. And he goes on. Um, we can have lots of questions about what any of these people are talking about, but I think it brings up perhaps the, to me, very practical question, uh, which is, one, um, are psychedelics beneficial in the sense of moving you towards living life more like a bodhisattva? Or, at a less exciting level, uh, are they good for the level you are now since what I've found when you do these kind of public events that most of the bodhisattvas don't come. <laughs> they have compassion for us doing this, uh, but they really don't show up. So if I'm wrong and some of your bodhisattvas just levitate on just enough so you can see <laughs> we will end the evening right there. We'll all work with you. But since some of us are not yet at the bodhisattvic level, at least in this lifetime, those are real questions. Maybe one place we could go is to talk about, um, you, you mentioned those experiences. What are the qualities of experience that would be, um, could be in accord with Buddhism um, from a psychedelic experience? Uh, because there's lots of things that happen on a psychedelic experience that maybe you mentioned have nothing to do with Buddhism. Maybe the majority of any trip. So, uh, what are they? Um, this might just be one useful framework to think about. And a lot of people have written about this, trying to define different qualities. The, the one that is my favorite so far is um, it's pretty old. Um, Walter Pankey, thank you. Pankey is um, the so-called Good Friday Experiment. Some people may know. This was in 1966. Jim probably knows some of the people involved in this. Um, it was uh, um, in the Christian setting, but uh, these were theological students um, in a seminary school on a Good Friday service that were, um, that were given psilocybin as an, a scientific experiment uh, with a um, placebo for some people, and so they tried to really, you know, check it out. And they had they, they came up beforehand with the kind of like uh, they call it um, the nine category typology of mystical state of consciousness. So kind of like um, list of qualities of mystical experience. <laughs> and uh, we usually don't use that word so much in Buddhism. In my experience, mystical experience it sounds a little too far out or something. <laughs> But when I looked up mystical in the dictionary, uh, 
it says, having the nature of an individual, direct, subjective communion with either with God or with ultimate reality. So in that case, if we say um, direct communion with ultimate reality, that's uh, very much in accord with Buddha Dharma. And the actual definitions here also have a nice list talking about the um, experience uh, in Buddhism. Also, we'd say in Buddhism, especially again from the from the Bodhisattva Mahayana perspective, that it's not about mystical experience or uh, um, communion with ultimate reality for its own sake. You know, that's even though that might be really wonderful, that's not the point in and of itself. You could say the point of uh, realizing non-duality or communion with ultimate truth is um, both for personal uh, liberation from one's own uh, bondage and suffering and discontent. Uh, it's a basic Buddhist teaching that our, our, um, our suffer the root of all our problems is the belief that things are separate and outside us and that things like substantially exist in and of themselves. So the insight that those are actually illusions is um, profoundly can release one from, uh, from all kinds of suffering. If it's deeply realized and then integrated into one's life. But even more, we could say in Buddhism, the Mahayana Buddhism, that um, the purpose of that very insight is not even our own liberation from suffering. It's so that we can really help others and really meet others with complete openness and sense of non-separation. That's the Bodhisattva path. Uh, so, realization of non-duality, non-separation, that people aren't who we think they are, and that, uh, that yeah, the people aren't who we think they are, is very beneficial to those people that we meet. <laughs> so with that in mind, it's the kind of like overarching goal, you could say, of Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, here's some uh, categories of so-called mystical states of consciousness. One is um, unity, and defined as both the internal unity, that is the loss of usual sensory impressions about the, you know, relating to the external world, and the loss of self, but without becoming unconscious. In a way, we lose our, our self when we go to sleep at night, but while remaining fully conscious, no sense of me as a separate individual. In the most complete experiences of this kind, there is pure awareness with no content and no external or internal distinctions. The awareness of oneness or unity or non-duality is experienced and remembered afterwards. So that's uh, internal unity. External unity finds unity through the external world, perceived outwardly with the physical senses. So a sense of underlying oneness is felt behind the multiplicity. So this is like there's still a pure and apparent external world, but there's no sense of separation between ourself and the objects of the world, even though we're <coughs> perceiving objects. That's an external unity. All objects are part of the same undifferentiated unity. So then some other ones are transcendence of time and space, both um, clock time and our own sense of personal past and future history. Maybe not as important in Buddhism, but I think you do find Buddhist teachings about this too. Uh, deeply felt positive mood joy, blessedness, or peace. Again, Buddhism doesn't emphasize this so much unless it's the, the peace and joy of complete non-grasping. So if some kind of uh, psychedelic experience is really blissful in and of itself, that wouldn't really be a reason to, you know, any kind of, any kind of joy or bliss that's conditioned in any way is, um, wouldn't really be the bliss of nirvana. Buddha did, does say that nirvana is bliss, though. So, uh, <clears throat> sense of sacredness, um, 
a non-rational, intuitive response of awe and wonder. I think you might not find that in the sutras exactly, but I think that's definitely a quality of um, uh, experience of Buddha Dharma. Um, another big one is that I feel like, besides unity, maybe another most important is what he's calling panki. It's calling objectivity and relativity, but he's defining as an insightful knowledge felt at an intuitive, non-rational level gained by direct experience, and the certainty that such knowledge is truly real as opposed to the feeling that the experience is a subjective delusion. So probably many people, I know I have felt um, uh, with psychedelics that um, knowing that this is the influence of a chemical, but knowing that even so, the, um, the realization of how things are at that time is um, that is not just a, um, a chemically induced delusion. I think that might be familiar to people. The deep conviction that really we aren't separate. We know that. Even though there's a lot of maybe other distortion and so on happening, on the deepest level we're, uh, we're convinced beyond any um, uh, um, you know, rational thought. Paradoxicality is another quality of mystical experience. Um, like in Buddhism, we might say, form itself is emptiness. Emptiness is form. It's paradoxical. It doesn't really make sense rationally, but in a mystical experience, it makes complete sense. <laughs> and, um, and related to that is alleged ineffability, meaning the experience is beyond words. So if somebody were to say, well, can you explain how a form it really is emptiness? I'm sorry, no. <laughs> um, transiency is the temporary nature of mystical experience, that we do return to usual experience for the most part. Maybe the Buddha never did, but most part it, it, it's a temporary experience. Um, and then maybe also, lastly, uh, and maybe most importantly, is persisting positive changes in attitude and behavior after the experience is over. Um, and this is four parts. Uh, positive changes toward oneself, toward others, toward life, and toward the mystical experience itself. So positive changes in relation to oneself would be like that um, personality traits that we haven't really noticed, like kind of unconscious um, problem, you know, issues with ourself, karmic tendencies, we'd say in Buddhism, are um, faced, seen directly, and dealt with. And I think this is, this is a kind of maybe a more, like there's the ultimate realizations that could happen in a mystical experience, and this would be more like a conventional realization, just this mundane karmic stuff. A very important part of Buddhist practice. We're dealing with our stuff and uh, both deep meditation practice um, and uh, psychedelics can also have this tendency of bringing up all this unconscious sludge of our, of our kind of karmic stuff to really look at it in a kind of therapeutic way. Uh, change relating to others, and I think this is a very important. Uh, and true in, in both the cases, that more sensitivity, tolerance, love, and openness of others. Lasting changes through mystical experience. Uh, changes towards life itself, particularly relating to the, the meaning of life, vocational commitment, appreciation of all life are uh, strengthened. And changes toward relating to mystical experience itself. Um, it's regarded as valuable and useful, it's easier to appreciate and understand others' mystical experiences and their crazy talk <laughs> about mystical experience. If we have that, we, oh, I understand. It might be different than mine, but um, I deeply honor that possibility. Um, so it's maybe a framework we can get into some of like, what we're talking about here. Um, those... Um 
that wonderful list, uh, as I was listening to it, I was going back into my own past and kind of making little check marks and maybe not making little check marks. Um, was that true for some of you? Yeah. Were you checking off psychedelic experiences or times of Buddhist practice? Or both? I mean, that's really the, the question here is, uh, are these overlapping worlds? Then the next question is, is that a good idea? And so forth. And then also, um, are there problems here? And so I think at this point, um, we're going to take a break in a little while, but why don't we try a question or two and see what happens. Now, uh, just so you know, and some of you I know have forgotten this, but I'm going to tell you what a question is. <laughs> some of you have been to other events. <laughs> a question is a sentence, one sentence, it may have a clause or two. It at the end it the voice goes up. <laughs> it is not a statement, it is not a position paper, um, it is not a chance to sell something. Um, and it definitely does not start with before I can ask my question I have to tell you about my trip. <laughs> I assure you in this very uh, sophisticated audience that should your trip have been a meditative experience in Sashin or had it been uh, dropping MDA at Burning Man after 36 hours of no sleep, <laughs> we know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, it's clear what a question is. Now, I should warn you that I have a terrible habit of when you forget, I remind you. <laughs> Such as, thank you, and then we'll go to someone else. <laughs> so, if there's a question, or at least you can fake it, you know, you can pretend it's a question, it's okay. But it has to still meet the criteria. <laughs> and let's see, because one of our questions is, see, we know why we came here. Because we like each other, this is a fun way to spend an evening, and we get to talk about these things. Um, had we charged you, we would have really known why we got you. <laughs> but um, what we agreed on from the onset is Tokyo said, this is donations, which is simply a better way to, to live. So we don't have a lot of stake other than that we're already having a wonderful experience. So we don't know why you're here, and one of the possibilities is you have a question. Now, Remember, the chances of getting an answer are slim. <laughs> but a question is far better than an answer. The problem with an answer is it ends the discussion. So I think what we will probably have is questions and then comments. So let's see what happens. Does someone have a question? Yes, please. Um. I think I can speak loud enough. I want you to stand up because that will make you speak a little louder. Okay. Either with psychedelics or practice, how do we get past the problem that once we've seen something, now we want to get back there and we're grasping it and we're looking for it and it's really hard to get there because it's a state of innocence, right? And so and that's been my personal experience. Is it, I had a well, you get the idea. <laughs> That's a great question, and I think we, we definitely want to talk about it. Is, uh, um, we have, we have a, a wonderful experience that we feel like is really beneficial, um, and then how do we get back there? It's a, it's a state of innocence, so any movement or wish to get back to a state of innocence is already not innocent. Uh, and this is yeah a very um, major issue in Buddhist practice, and and maybe not talked about so much in psychedelic practice, but I think it should be because uh, that's what we call like you know grasping or attachment that we have an experience and then like I got to get that again, and that just that's the definition of discontent in Buddhism. That's it. <laughs> It's not talked about in psychedelics enough, no. 
but it is that wonderful paradox of I just did this and then this incredibly wonderful thing happened and I want it again, so the question is, do you have any stuff on you? And how fast can I get back there? Um, I have a book out called Psychedelic Explorer's Guide, and one of the unread parts says, after you had a major experience, if within the first six weeks after it, you feel you need to have, you need to get back there, all you're doing is avoiding something that's come up. And the wait another six weeks or six months um, if you're serious. Uh, so there's a tendency to say, well, it was, it was fine out there and it's crummy here. Obviously the solution is to go back there. Um, there may be a similar problem in Buddhism of uh, if things aren't going well, if you meditate long enough, maybe the person will leave. <laughs> and also, of course, I'm, I'm intrigued by the question of, let us say you've had this experience of bliss, and what we now know, at least in psychedelics, the first actually genuinely interesting and new research in decades is that the blood flow to the parts of the brain that identify you as you are less. So literally, as we know from the meditative traditions, if you get out of the way, um, the universe brightens. Mm -hmm. Now the thing that always interests me is, if I want that, and the I that wants it is going to be diminished if I get it, I can't get it. Because it's the me, the me that gets out of the way can never get it. My concern. But maybe, of course, if I had the right psychedelic, <laughs> one of the new ones, maybe, <laughs> then it would be different. And you can see the problem. A quote that comes to mind I read that it, from Dogen Zenji, the founder of our um, Japanese Zen tradition, is uh, a person cannot realize Buddha Dharma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Only a Buddha can realize Buddha Dharma. So the, the question, the question I think has to then be re remain as a question. And again, what's the purpose of practice, if that practice is psychedelic or if it's uh, Buddhist? Because one of the other questions is if um, most people are not going to probably have um, this total highest and best experience, and certainly, like Buddha, won't retain it. But well, actually, maybe I'm wrong. Let me ask a question. Um, whatever that highest and, and most amazing experience is, let's call it the, the unity, where there is no division between you and the universe, and that you understand that there is no distinctions of time and space, and that uh, while your uh, personality and body are mortal, you're not. You know what I'm talking about. How many of you have actually experienced that? Okay, so here we are, and everybody came back. <laughs> and I know in the many, many people I've sat with, one of the questions that they ask when they come back is, why did I come back into this bus <laughs> with all of its neurotic problems? Mm -hmm. When I was out there, it was clear that I wasn't necessarily attached to it. Um, and the answer is, uh, I'm the famous idea, but I know the problems. <laughs> I was just appalled when I returned as a graduate student at Stanford, of all places. <laughs> and it was clear that this was not the right um, place to work out this particular um, karmic destiny that I was experiencing. So it is a problem, and it is a question, and it's useful to keep it as a question. And it's the question, really, of what is my motivation for what I'm doing? And a deeper question, of course, who is it that has such motivation? And perhaps below that, what is it that propels me to ask that question? And we can keep going down. So listen. Another thought about this is, uh, particularly in Mahayana Buddhism, we talk about uh, the realization of a Buddha and that the 
the mode of life we want to keep in mind is the integration of what we call the ultimate truth and the conventional truth, and that they're not separate. The ultimate truth where there is no division, complete unity, there's no self and other um, emptiness. And then the conventional truth where there is self and other, there's the appearance of self and other, and the appearance of landing in Stanford, and me with a certain name and all that, um, and that those two are not, those two truths are not separate, the conventional and the ultimate. And if you get stuck in wanting to live just in the ultimate, that's not the way. You can't actually um, relate to anybody there, because there isn't anybody. <laughs> so, complete integration. And of course, most of us are living in the conventional truth, the conventional world, almost all the time. So, uh, we need to realize the um, ultimate truth, but we need to be, as Nagarjuna, one of the great Indian ancestors says, in order to realize the ultimate truth, you have to be completely grounded in the conventional truth, which means like these ethical precepts and so on. If we kind of neglect how we're taking care of ourselves and people, then it's actually impossible to realize the ultimate truth, at least in Buddhism. Now, this is something where, in the psychedelic world, some people might say, let's bypass the convention, like, go straight to the ultimate, and this could be a problem. Right. And there's a wonderful term called the spiritual bypass. <laughs> That's when you, you realize you're God and you're still screwed up. <laughs> and for those of us who like that, or acknowledge that, you think, well, the alternative is to never quite get there. And from the psychedelic point of view, that seems unnecessary. And so it's the, the question of, of you know, climbing the, the mountain to the peak. And many people I've talked to said the, it's necessary to do it gradually. And other people have said, well, I'd kind of like to take a helicopter to the top. <laughs> and really look around and see if it's worth all that climbing. <laughs> Alan Watts had a great book called This Is It. And then he had another book because that wasn't it. <laughs> so there we are. And, and given that we are, um, we are all divinely realized beings and there's only one of us and there's total unity, but at another level, it's probably time for a break. Thank <laughs> you.